Well, good morning and praise God. God bless you for joining us. I want to greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I want to thank you for joining us for today's Word in Season. I'm Pastor Stephanie, and it is a pleasure to come to you with the Word of God today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are so blessed and so grateful that we have this privilege to share your word. We ask in the name of Jesus that you will preserve this time that we have with you to share this word. We pray for the listeners, those who will hear your word today. Let your word bring life and light and understanding to the simple. Open the eyes of the blind and set at liberty those that are bound. We commit this word in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, bless the Lord and thank you for joining us this morning. Now, we have been on this journey for the last five weeks and we have gone through the chapters 1 to 7 in the book of Romans. And this week we will be picking up from chapter 8. Now, over the past few weeks we see... Paul introduced to us and he explains the situation and the condition of sin and he explained that grace provided a remedy for sin. He looked at how the sinful nature of man is constantly enticing us back to do sinful acts and sometimes even though our desire is to do the will of God to please him then the battle continues to rage in our flesh between the desire to do good and the desire to do evil. In, in last week's lesson, we see where Paul introduced the solution to this problem. Jesus Christ the Lord was able to deliver us from the power of sin. And he makes it clear in Galatians 5 and verse 16 to 18 that if we walk in the spirit, then we will not fulfill the desires or the lust of the flesh. And it is important that to walk in step with, with the Spirit, step by step in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is the only remedy that can deliver us, that can give us the power to overcome the power of sin and our flesh. Amen. So today we are picking up from chapter 8 and we will see how Paul goes on with his discourse and how he takes us on this great journey. Hallelujah into this wonderful book of Romans. So if you would turn with me your Bibles to Romans chapter eight, and we will continue to read from verse one. Romans eight and verse one says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who walk in the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And we will pause there at verse six for the time being. So Paul takes us on this journey and Paul, explains to us that sin has hijacked the human heart. And in the Old Testament scriptures, or the Torah, or what we would refer to as the book of, books of the law, this couldn't really do anything about it. Remember, the scriptures were originally written by the Jewish people. And so this, this document that was written, that we now call the book of the Romans, was originally written to the Roman church, which was a mix of Jewish believers and Gentiles who were in Rome at the time. And so Paul was using the book of the law, which was the guidebook for their religious life, to explain to 
the new believers and those who were starting to become acquainted with this lifestyle in God of how their scriptures, the Old Testament, had been given to them. But unfortunately, what it did was to reveal sin, but it could not fix the problem. So a more permanent solution was needed for sin. While the law and the Torah served to reveal sin and made us conscious of sin, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the solution is revealed. And it, this solution is not only revealed, but it is also sustained through the power of the Holy Spirit. So God chose Jesus Christ as a representative from among the Israelites, from the Jewish people, that he would become their go-between. He would become the the one who would stand in the gap to pay the penalty for sin by his death and resurrection. What Jesus did was after he died, he released the Holy Spirit to help believers to fulfill their responsibilities, to fulfill the requirements of the law and obey God. And as a result, through this process, he continues to restore us back to a right relationship with God. So here we see in chapter 8 that Paul is encouraging the believers, those who are in Christ, that they did not need to feel condemned when their flesh and their spirit were at war. Because there is that tendency to feel defeated and to feel condemned because of this constant battle between the spirit and the flesh as Paul explains in chapter 7. He said that as long as we as believers were walking in or being led by the Spirit of God, then our minds and our desires were to do the will of the Holy Spirit. And in that way, we would automatically live in obedience to the Word of God and to walk in a reflection of His image and His likeness. Because for those who walk in the Spirit, they had the upper hand over sin. Hallelujah. When we are walking in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to overcome our sins and our desires to do sinful acts. Sin could not reign or dominate the lives of the Spirit-filled believer. When the Spirit is in charge, then the life of the believer is empowered. And this is how we are able to overcome that strength and the power of the sinful flesh. If we look in chapter 8 and verse 9 to 11, those who accepted Christ were dead to sin and they belonged to God and as such were made alive in Christ. Let's read that from Romans 8 verse 9 to, 11, to 10. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Hallelujah. In other words, when we become born again, we no longer live according to the flesh or under the control of our sinful desires. Because the spirit of God that now lives inside of us and is empowering us. He gives us the ability to overcome the enticement and the seduction of our sinful nature. And in that way, we are able to live a life that is pleasing to Almighty God. So when we come to God, the death that occurs here, according to what the Apostle Paul says, that if we are in Christ, the body is dead because of sin. What he re is referring to here is not to a physical death, otherwise we could not be speaking. What Paul is referring to is the act of being dead to sin. Paul was saying to us, because we are now dead to sin, that means we no longer live for sin. We no longer live to do sinful things. We no longer are captive to sin. It means that we are now made alive in Christ Jesus. And as a result, we are able to use this new life to express the life of God. The dead body in which sin dwells can be made the vehicle for expressing the life of God. So, and verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hallelujah. The solution to the problem of the flesh is the Holy Spirit, my brothers, my sisters, my friend. He gives life to our mortal bodies. To become spiritually minded means overcoming the deadness of the body and experiencing life and peace. This is a resurrection life. According to Philippians 3 and verse 10. According to verse 12, the more you practice to walk in step, the more we practice to walk in line with the Holy Spirit or to live according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then the more the flesh becomes subdued, the more we spend time, the more we become like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, then the more our flesh becomes subdued, it goes into submission. Because now, with the Spirit of God is what it becomes dominant in our lives. Hallelujah. And oftentimes you will hear the preacher say, we must crucify the flesh or kill the flesh. We do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And that way, the desire to do sinful acts are becoming less and less because we are now elevating, we are promoting, we are magnifying the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's look at verse 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then hears, hears of God and joint hears with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Wow, I love this scripture. I love this part of this scripture today because it is telling us that we who receive the Spirit of God have been adopted into his family. Paul addressed an issue that is important to everyone, but in the context in which he wrote this passage of scripture to the Roman church, he was explaining to them that in the same way that not every member of the Jewish family or the ethnic Hebrew family were faithful members of the covenant family, which was the covenant that was given to, to Moses. The same is true, to us, true for us today. Those who choose to live in covenant relationship with God, they are the true believers. You can, you, you know, it is, it is so disheartening at times when you hear people say, I'm a Christian. And a lot of people, based on where they come from, because they were born into a, a family, maybe an Islamic family or a Hindu family or a Buddhist family or with a Catholic family. They were told that you were born in this family and so you, you are, are one of this. So a lot of people who are from these areas who do not get that teaching, they believe that if you were born into a Christian family, then you are automatically a child of God. I am really sorry to burst your bubble today or to, but I must clarify for you something. Being a Christian does not make you a believer or a child of God. You may believe in God, but Jesus has told us that there is only one way to heaven and it is through the blood of Jesus. So Paul was correcting this issue and we're making it very clear. Paul was clarifying this issue for us. And he was saying, well, you were born into the Hebrew family or you were born into this family or you were bought as a slave by a Jewish owner and you may have decided that you want to follow their way of life. But to be a child of God, to become a son of God, there was a different recipe. Hallelujah. So those who are led by the Spirit of God denotes a submissive dependence of the believer on the Holy Spirit. This is a reflection of that parent-child relationship. So the Holy Spirit is the one who seals the deal, is the one who writes the birth certificate that says, now you are a child of God. So 
when we are led by the Spirit of God, this is a demonstration or a direct reflection that we are now children of the sovereign God. Hallelujah. And you can read more about this in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. So how did we end up becoming children of God? How did we who were slaves to sin know our status has been changed to son and children of God? How did this sonship come about? And what are the benefits or what is in this package? Believers become the sons of God through adoption. When believers accepted the free gift of Christ, when he died on the cross and when he rose again, when people believed that this act of death and resurrection purchased their salvation and restored us to a right relationship with God, by faith, they receive the grace of God and the receiving of that grace of God is how we became engrafted or become adopted into the family of Jesus Christ. This is how we gain that position of sonship. This process occurred when the believers became adopted into the family of God. And as a result of this new status, there are several things that change as several things that occurred the first thing that happens when we become believers when we accept the free gift of grace through faith we are no longer slaves to fear hallelujah the songwriter says i am no longer a slave to fear but i am a child of god hallelujah through this process of adoption we are no longer slaves and as such we have no need to be afraid of what tomorrow holds for us instead we have received the spirit of sonship the spirit of adoption that gives us the right to address almighty god as papa daddy dada hallelujah we are now able to say papa when you, your back is against the wall, when you are in need, when situations and circumstances come your way and you know that your father in heaven is able to help you, you don't need to go to God as a slave. You don't need to go to God as a beggar. He is your father and you have been born again to receive this birth certificate that says, I am a son of God. And so when your circumstances come upon you, you are able to go to him and say, Papa, Daddy, Dada, I am here. And you know, just like our Heavenly Father in St. Matthew chapter, I believe chapter 5 and 6, and the Word of God tells us that in the same way that our, heaven, our earthly Father knows how to give us good gifts, then our Heavenly Father can do even better. Hallelujah. We can cry out to Him, Abba, Father, just like Jesus when He called Him Abba. Jesus called him Abba because Abba was the Aramaic word for Papa or Dada or Daddy. Because as an adopted child, we have equal inheritance with Jesus. Did you hear what I said? Because I am adopted by this man who now is my legal father, it means that all his other children and I have equal rights. Well, the Bible tells me that Jesus is the son of God. And if I am also now adopted by Jesus' father, it means that Jesus is my brother and I have equal rights to my father's kingdom, my father's riches, just as my brother Jesus does. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The second thing I want to point out that when we become a son or a child of God, then the spirit verifies the relationship and he grants us access. You know, the, nobody knows your needs better than your parents, especially when we are children. As a child, if you have children, you know you can look at your children. If you have 10 children, you know their needs differently and individually. And so you know what are the essential things that your child needs. But you also know some of their, you know their wants because you know their desires. You can watch their behaviors and you can determine, okay, my child, my son now, he wants something to drink. And he's becoming agitated now because he's hungry. Or this one, he has been a good boy today. I should give him a treat. Let me give him something a little special. Well, I believe with my whole heart that as we as earthly parents, our behavior reflects that of our Heavenly Father to some extent. And so the Holy Spirit, who represents the DNA of the Father 
that each child carries bears witness with our spirit. When the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, because the Holy Spirit is God's spirit, then in other words, I want to use the analogy of the human DNA. Just in the same way that I carry the DNA of my father or my parents. When the Holy Spirit is deposited in me, I believe the Holy Spirit now is that verification that I now carry the DNA of God. And so when the Holy Spirit who is alive, he's a person, he's, he's full of grace and power. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, when he is inside of me, he now is able to search the deep things of my heart and then he takes that report to my father. But let me show you a greater mystery. It is even more important to know that what the Holy Spirit does, he takes from the Father, deposits it into us. He takes the purpose. He takes the, the, the will of God from the Father. He takes God's plans. He deposits them in our spirit. And then our spirit begins to read and decode the plans and the purposes of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when we begin to desire the plans and the purposes of God, the Holy Spirit now is able to take that report back to the Father and say, now your child has activated that plan. Your child's desire has put into activation the desire for this plan that you have to be activated. Your child has now received and decoded the message from you that now in at this season in their lives you want to bless them at this season in their lives you want them to go deeper at this season in their lives you want them to receive a fresh revelation and so by that i will activate the desire to pray and ask you for that thing that you have already planted in their spirit and then i will bring that message back to you hallelujah this is what i believe happens by the power of the holy spirit it means, therefore, child of God, you cannot afford to live your life without the Holy Spirit actively involved in your life. You will miss out on the good stuff. You will miss out on the package, the great and glorious riches that are contained in the, being a child of Almighty God. Hallelujah. Through the Spirit of the Holy Spirit interaction, the Holy Spirit is able to effectively communicate what we need to our Father. And our Father then, by knowing what we need, because he already told the Holy Spirit to tell us what we need, <laughs> he then activates it. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. If you look in, in verse 26 and verse 27, you will see it. He said that we don't know how to pray. And so the Holy Spirit who he, he is inside of us, he makes intercessions with groanings that cannot be uttered. My brothers, my sisters, my friend, I believe that the deposit that was made in my spirit by God's spirit enables me to have the desire for certain things. Have you ever been in a situation where God has given you something? For example, God may have blessed you with a job or maybe it's your husband or a child. God may have blessed you with a piece of property, something of great value. But you realize that, you know, along the way, either people begin to perplex you, circumstances, tribulations and trials have become to haunt you. And you realize that what God told me, God has birthed this purpose in my heart. And there's a time in your life when sometimes you become discouraged. Sometimes you feel like giving up and you feel like, why do I even bother? Is it worth the fight? But a day will come when you will sit down and you will remember, but God, you told me that you were going to bless me with this child. And even though this child might be rude and dis disruptive, this husband of mine, God is perplexing me. He's causing my heart to be aching. Maybe it's this piece of property and somebody wants to steal my land. It's my job and there are opposition on the job. But you, there comes a point in your life when the spirit of God that is inside of you reminds you that this that I have given to you, this that you have was given to you by God, your father as a free gift. This blessing that you are enjoying was given to you by your father and under no circumstances should you become discouraged. Hallelujah somebody and let me encourage somebody today that whatever your circumstances may be remember that the spirit of God is God's DNA in you and it 
proves that you are a child of God. And so today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may your spirit be activated to walk over the trials and the circumstances. May the Spirit of God inside of you activate you and activate those plans and the purposes and cause you not to be discouraged in Jesus' name. May the spirit of grace be upon you today that you will fight for your blessing. You overcome the struggles and the hurdles in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The spirit of God is interceding on your behalf this morning. As a joint here, thirdly, as joint hearers, we share in the benefits and the suffering. So in a few verses, we read a while ago that, that if we are hearers with God, then we are joint hearers with Christ. It means that whatever belongs to Jesus belongs to you. The victory, the power, everything that belongs to the king's son belongs to you. Then it means that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. Thanks be to almighty God. When we become the joint heirs with Christ, it activates the inheritance to inter eternal life. See, when we become born into the family of God, we have been born into things that incorrupt are incorruptible. Remember, he says that now God has given us the power and the victory over sin and death. Hallelujah. And so as a result, it means that a part of this package, if we are children of the king, the king wants his children to be with him. And so as part of the package, now we have been free from sin and death which would short circuit our life. And now we have been given eternal life through Jesus Christ. But take note of this, my brother, my sister, my friend. We must share in Christ's suffering. If we are his siblings and we share in his blessing, we must share in his suffering. Many preachers today, we don't preach about the suffering Christ. We don't preach about the, the gospel of suffering. We don't tell people that when you become a slave to Christ, when you become born again into this family of God, and now we have deliberately and willfully submitted ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it means that when Jesus is persecuted, we are persecuted. But in St. Matthew chapter 5, he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For great is your reward, hallelujah, in heaven with me. It means that if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. And I wish somebody would shout a bigger amen. For in Philippians 3 and verse 10, and even in 11 to 14, he says that we will share with him in his glory. And even on this earth, I believe that every true believer, every child of God will share in the greater glory that is coming, that is being poured out upon the earth even at this time. Hallelujah. Before the suffering part of the package discourages us, my brothers and sisters. Let me tell you something. Before you decide that I don't want to do any, have any of the suffering business with this family of God. Let me tell you, Paul hastened to add in verse 18 that, For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory of God which shall be revealed in us. I believe that in this life, we will experience a greater glory. We will experience the greater glory of God because God has promised us that he will grant us his grace. Paul reassures us that the suffering is only for a season. Hallelujah. But it will never be able to be compared. It cannot outweigh the greater glory, the weight of the eternal glory that is awaiting us as described in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. And if we look over in St. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 29, he will tell you that the divine compensation package is a hundredfold better than anything that we could experience in this life. So in the rest of the passage from verse 19 to 23 of, of Romans 8, we see that the entire creation stands to benefit from our choice. Let me say that again. The entire creation stands to benefit from the choice when you choose Jesus Christ. If you go back to the book of Genesis, you will see that when God pronounced the curse upon Adam, the sin 
when sin occurred and God cursed Adam, the curse, when Adam activated the curse, I should say, because God had already given the commandment that if you obey, this will happen. And if you disobey, this would happen. So God didn't curse Adam. Adam activated a curse upon himself and the entire human race inherited that curse. But not just people, the earth, the physical earth, the land, the trees, the weather, every single thing upon the earth was impacted as a result because of the, the caretaker, the one who had dominion, the king that was put in charge over the earth. He broke the protocol, and as a result of that, the entire earth was cursed and is still groaning today. Hallelujah. So creation is also waiting for its redemption so that the weather pattern can come back in sync with the plans and purpose of God. The plans, there will be no drought, there will be no pestilence, there will be no storms and earthquakes. Hallelujah. The creation is waiting for you and I to submit to the spirit of God so that by in our obedience as this, the Adam's descendants, then when we become obedient to God, the more obedient we are to God, then the creation will also reap the benefits. Blessed be the name of Jesus. So even we as believers, although we have the spirit of God dwelling inside of us, we are still subject to this physical suffering. So yes, that is part of what I'm trying to say today. That even though you were born again, some of us, we have diabetes, we have hypertension, all sorts of sickness, all manner of infirmities. That is as a result of the fallen situation upon the earth. But thanks be to God that when we are raptured, when we die in Christ, then we will no longer experience these aches and pains. But today, because we are still part of the earth, as part of the whole ecosystem of the earth, we are groaning and waiting with expectation for our deliverance, for our physical body to be transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit from mortal to immortality into this heavenly body that God has promised to us. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us as an assurance. It is our, the Holy Spirit is our rainbow. The Holy Spirit is our promise that when Jesus departed this earth, he left the Holy Spirit with us as a promise, as a deposit, as a down payment, to say, as an insurance policy to say that because I am going, I am leaving you something better. I'm giving you a greater plan. This is my insurance deposit that one day I will come back for you. And for those who carry this certificate, which is the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. When I come back, those who have the policy, these are the people who will be able to reap the benefits of eternal life. Glory be to Jesus. In verse 24 and verse 25 of Romans 8, he says, For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. If you can see something, there's no need to, be, to hope about it. If you see rain falling, why are you going to hope for rain to fall? The rain is falling. For why does one still hope for what he sees? There's no point. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Hallelujah. So when we do not see, we eagerly wait. And so even as we are unable to see the promise itself, but we can wait with perseverance because we have a lively hope through God's promises and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, when we become sons of God, through our sonship in God, we have this lively hope. Hallelujah. This hope that we have is what we are sharing with you today. Bill Hybels put it like this, and let me read for you. We still are the only message on planet Earth that can give people what their hearts need most, which is hope. Hope that sins can be forgiven. Hope that prayers can be answered. Hope that doors of opportunity that seem locked can be opened. Hope that broken relationships can be reconciled. Hope that the sickness and the diseases that we bear in our bodies can be healed. Hope that our children that have gone astray, that the bondage that we experience can be delivered. Hope that the damaged trust can be restored. And hope that dead churches can be resurrected. Glory be to God. Of all the people upon the face of this earth, 
Believers must claim and carry this hope and live it and radiate it so that the world around us may be able to see it. Not just that, we must proclaim this hope. We must proclaim this hope to those around us so that they know that this hope is something that they can achieve. They are able to share in this hope if they too becomes engrafted, can, if they too choose adoption into the family of Almighty God. This hope is available to you today, my brother, my sister, and friend. My prayer today is that for those of you who would hear this message, that you would hear the truth and you would know the truth of your identity that is buried inside of you. My prayer today is that the DNA of God that was deposited in you when he created you, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you will allow this DNA to be activated so that you can be restored to a right relationship with God. Today, my prayer for you, for you who have been backslidden, for those of you who have turned away from the family of God, for those of you who run away children, those of you who have left home and gone astray, chasing down pig's food, Today, my encouragement to you, will you come back to your Heavenly Father's family? Will you return? He's calling out to you today. He's saying, my child, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He's saying to you, my child, I love you and I have a greater plan and a purpose for you. The plans I have for you are for good and not for evil, to prosper you and not to harm you. He is saying that you have an expected end. He is saying to you, my child, there is work for you, waiting you to be done. And I have my peace. I have my power and anointing that I'm ready to deposit in you so that you are able to be effective. Let the DNA of God that you carry be activated in you today in Jesus' name. I tell you today that there is hope for you in Christ Jesus because he was crucified as an innocent man by the will of God to pay the penalty for you and me. He died and descended into hell and he took the keys of death and the grave and hell. And he, because of that, it means that you and I do not have to go and stay there eternally. Because of that, he has given us access to eternal life. We can accept our position as sons and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ so that we can receive this eternal inheritance that has been provided for us. Isaiah says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Will you answer the call today? Today, I want to call to young people. The enemy has launched an attack against our youth. Because he realizes that the youth are the promise that God has given us for these last days. My brother, my sister, my friend, if you don't believe it, let me tell you, we are in the last days. We are in the last of the last days. And God has promised us in Joel chapter 2 that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. But the spirit can only be poured out on those who are prepared, those who are ready, those who are clean and are ready to receive the spirit. Will you accept him today? Will you receive Christ and enable the activation of this DNA and the pour outpouring of the Spirit of God upon your life today? Let me pray with you today. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we come today. Father, we recognize, Lord, that the situation that we are in, it is not helpless. For in Christ, we have a lively hope. Lord, we have a lively hope that sins can be forgiven. We have a lively hope that sickness and infirmities and diseases can be healed. We have this lively hope through Christ that because we are sons of God who have been adopted into his family, then we have access to the full package of benefits. And so even now, Lord, we activate the package. We activate the benefits as your children, as people who carry your DNA. 
And so even now, Lord, we pray for our brothers and our sisters, those who have left home, those who have strayed from the family. We pray in the name of Jesus, let the love of God that is in, that has been shed abroad in our hearts, let this love redeem them, restore them, reactivate the DNA that they carry. Switch it on, mighty God, by the power of your spirit today, that they will yearn and long to be with their father. Father, we pray that the spirit of God that you, you promised to pour out upon your people, even today, Lord, let the spirit of God be poured out in abundance with good measure upon your people so that we can live in step and walk in line with the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for restoration today. We thank you for healing. We thank you for reconciliation. For those things that are out of alignment with your plan and your purposes. We pray in the name of Jesus that there shall be complete and full restoration and reconciliation and restitution in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for those who do not know you that may be watching this, this broadcast. We pray that the seed of grace will be planted in their hearts, that they will desire to have you as their father and as such reap eternal life and be delivered from sin and shame. We pray now with thanksgiving in and through the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. God bless you today, child of God. Thank you for tuning in to this word in season. And I do trust and pray that this word has been a blessing to you today. Remember that when we are sons of God, then we carry his DNA as reflected by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we are sons of God, we are joined here with Christ. And it's therefore means, it therefore means that we have access to all the benefits that Jesus Christ has. When we are sons of God, then it means that we are no longer slaves to fear. And so we do not have to worry about tomorrow because our lives are in God's hands. May God bless you and your family. Do me a favor and share this message with someone so that they too can hear the word of life. Bless someone, your family member, your unsafe family members, friends, co-workers, your neighbors. Maybe you don't know how to share this word and God has given us the ability to break it down for you so you can share it. By simply clicking on the button to share, you will have spread the word of God and you would have helped to advance the kingdom. God bless you and thank you for tuning in and for joining me today for another Word in Season. I am Pastor Stephanie Fletcher and until next time, I leave the shalom of God with you. May his peace be with you until we meet again. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye for now.